if Chinese government wins with this uh, ethnic genocide, uh, reprogramming Uyghurs through this conversion therapy, human engineering, then Uyghurs will be in the history books. The whole nation will be gone because it's a very targeted attack. They're taking Uyghur women away from their family members and forcing them to marry Chinese individuals. The Uyghur kids been sent to state-run orphanages and their parents are uh, indefinitely held in those camps. So there is no end in sight. Uh, if this continues, the Chinese will succeed. And if the Chinese uh, fail, uh, they're not going to be able to handle those two, three million people that have been tortured physically, emotionally, psychologically. I worry that they may start um, causing physical damages, specifically mass killing. I was one of those privileged uh, Uyghur uh, kids to grow up in an intellectual um, uh, and rather comfortable environment. I spent a lot of time in, in a college campus uh, as I grew up uh, back in the 80s. Uh, my dad is a retired university professor and my mom is a retired businesswoman. Uh, both of them taught me very different values um, academic, intellectual, uh, cultural, traditional. So it's combined. With that mindset, I went to inland China to study. Um, let's see, another uh, cultural environment, very different from the ones that I brought up um, or got used to. So in that Chinese environment, I was facing uh, uh, social uh, hostility. Uh, towards the Uyghurs as a minority or um, uh, racial profiling in, to the extent. But after I got to the United States, uh, particularly since 9-11, um, I, I find it enormously difficult and challenging to explain to people um, some of the unfounded charges, uh, slanderous charges that the Chinese government uh, uh, been telling around the world. Uh, on the Uyghurs, uh, Uyghur struggle, uh, the ultimate goal, legitimacy. Uh, that whenever the Uyghur issue comes up, the Chinese tells their counterparts they are separatists, extremists, or in some cases, terrorists. So some uh, government officials, policy experts, uh, tapped into that fear, uh, anxiety, that the Chinese created, it made our advocacy work very difficult. It required a lot of patience, explanations, and to the degree, understanding. Uh, as a diplomat or a government official, they have to uh, first focus on their jobs, even though what they heard from the Chinese side is unfunded. Um, so that is one of the biggest challenges, uh, different living in different political, social environment, uh, personally, uh, and facing, uh, a, a challenges, uh, as, as I described, uh, some of, sometime, um, based on the Chinese unfunded claims in the advocacy work, advocating the rights of the people that you left behind, that includes your family members your fellow countrymen is, a, is an honorable work and it's empowering and it's gratifying. But at the same time, it comes with a cost. Um, even if I did not uh, turn into a, um, a vocal uh, activism, uh, saying or, or telling the truth to the world about what has been the life for the Uyghurs, in past five, six decades. Uh, under the current environment, um, I don't think that any Uyghur will be spared. 
this is one of the mistakes that the Uyghur diaspora in particular has made, thinking that if you just sit quiet, the oppression will go away. You will be okay. To the contrary, the people who have been suffering the most are the people who tried to work with the system and even to the extent taken an appeasement position. When you look at the, the population pool today uh, in those detained uh, in the modern day concentration camps that we've been discussing, you'd be surprised that none of those people fits the profile of someone who poses danger to the society. Most of them, once upon a time, promoted as model citizens. What we have here includes people who has published, um, who have published recognized uh, academic science journals, uh, multilingual, uh, with degrees, uh, with very well established uh, academic accomplishments. Uh, recognition uh, and yet those are not enough for Chinese to spare them so what is the point when you deal with an authority that punishes you in my case because of what I do as a free person uh, in a uh, free society and what do you do when your brother marries the the daughter of someone that the Chinese government does not like. These kind of things are not a concern in a healthy and free society. And yet my family, uh, my parents and others related to me may have been unfairly subjected to uh, harassment, intimidations and punishments. Uh, I mentioned about my brother's marriage that in of itself is enough to understand how intrusive the Chinese government have been, has been in the lives of the Uyghurs, not only to those inside of China, but also the, those who live uh, outside of China uh, and become a citizens of their adopted countries. It affects definitely. Um, in, it would be dishonest for me to say that everything has been fine. It's not fine. Um, I have not seen my mother who brought me to this world 15 years. Um, so I haven't seen my mother a one third of my life. It makes me feel terrible. At the same time, uh, this encourages me to be a strong or stronger because at the end of the day, um, uh, letting others to manipulate your emotion, your mind, uh, your way of life is a way to a self-destruction. I, I will not let that happen. Uh, even some unthinkable happens tomorrow. Uh, there will be consequences for anyone uh, doing uh, harmful things to other, other human beings. Uh, I believe in justice. Uh, I believe in fairness. And I believe in people's uh, right to be happy, right to be respected and live with dignity. Some, some of my old friends uh, from college, from childhood, um, sometimes jokingly ask, did you know this was coming? I had no idea. Um, I never thought that I could see this level of brutality, this type of ghastly human rights abuses in the 21st century um, happening on our watch. But I did not know this was, this was gonna happen, what this is gonna happen. But what I did know is that um, leaving the country for some time, uh, equipped with knowledge and experience would be better for me personally and professionally. So after being able to establish my life uh, professional life and personal life. I believed in a, um, a healthy lifestyle and tried to maintain a healthy lifestyle 
uh, kind of a maintain semi normalcy, even though I was not allowed to see my parents or let uh, bring them to the United States to reunite, uh, or even kept it quiet. I didn't even discuss these matters with people, uh, let alone go on the media. Uh, I tried to focus on my job, but it got to the point of uh, impossible. Uh, to see people who are connected to you, even though they're not directly connected to you or related to you, suffer to this extent. Uh, there, are, there is crime against humanity is, is, is being committed against my people. So when the face up in the face of crime that you know is happening, it is uh, unconscionable. Uh, my life has been destroyed. Uh, even though I have a relative comfort, uh, stability, uh, happiness that I work to, I work so hard to establish. The Chinese government is taking that away from me. It's affecting my life. It'll be dishonest for me to say that it, it, it has affected. This is why this become very important work for me. Um, I am spending less time on the things that helped me to build the life that I was able to and spending more time on this, even though it has been emotionally, physically, psychologically exhausting. If China's government wins with this uh, ethnic genocide, uh, reprogramming Uyghurs through this conversion therapy, human engineering, then Uyghurs will be in the history books. The whole nation will be gone because it's a very targeted attack. They're taking Uyghur women away from their family members and forcing them to marry Chinese individuals. The Uyghur kids have been sent to state-run orphanages and their parents are uh, indefinitely held in those camps. So there is no end in sight. Uh, if this continues, the Chinese will succeed. And if the Chinese uh, fail, uh, they're not going to be able to handle those two, three million people that have been tortured physically, emotionally, psychologically. I worry that they may start um, causing physical damages, specifically mass killing. They're killing the Uyghurs without killing the physical body. The mind, soul have been killed already. So what is left is the physic, the physical body has not been uh, actually killed. So I worry either they win or lose, but bad news for us, for people who appreciate human values, lives, uh, I believe this is bad for the humanity and bad for the world. If Chinese will, uh, if Chinese manage to get away with this, this will become a new norm. We're seeing some strange things happening around the world today because we have no true leader, bold leader uh, with a vision to come out and defend civil liberties around the world. We used to have not only a leader, but leaders that we can depend on. I don't accept anything. Um, I'm ju I just take things one at a time. Um, I believe in persistence and I believe in the persistent effort eventually paying dividends. So, uh, and you need to stay hopeful, just keep doing the right thing. The others will not change their behaviors unless they were forced to. Others means governments. In the meantime, you have to continue to uh, advocate raise awareness and work with the governments, work with the business entities uh, to have a chance to be heard, uh, encouraging those individuals with power and influence to make a decision that would be beneficial for that person, that country, that government, uh, as well as the others who will benefit eventually. So um, staying hopeful is one of my best weapons against oppression, all the uh, tragic situations that I have been dealing with. 
I um I have been um able to hear uh personal accounts from the camp survivors. So when I hear those stories, it makes me believe that others have suffered personally more than I could imagine or could handle. So when you hear that kind of stories, of course it's heart wrenching. At the same time, you will get encouraged that things could be worse. I think maintaining a healthy lifestyle uh, and is extraordinarily. Uh, I, I believe uh, in healthy lifestyle. Um, it's small things such as you know eating well, uh, keeping uh, regular exercise, uh, and also reading a good book. Or books uh, kind of distract yourself from the things that could exhaust you uh, emotionally, mentally, uh, is one of the ways that you can uh, be more effective in the face of all the crazy, horrible things that are happening around you. Uh, and also uh, focus on one or two things, not a lot of things, uh, can also help to focus on what you wanted to accomplish. So there's a saying that if you wanted to, to do too many things, you will end up doing nothing. So um, focus, maintaining healthy uh, lifestyle. Uh, try to distract yourself uh, from the trauma or traumatic situation, uh, finding something not related. Uh, and also uh, hopefulness. You know, I can't emphasize the importance of staying hopeful. Uh, when you're in a situation like this uh, that I have become a part of. Uh, I believe in the power of staying hopeful, uh, especially when you're dealing with the oppression. And also, uh, significantly, uh, there is a moment momentum uh, building up uh, in support of the Uyghurs and in solidarity with the Uyghurs. Uh, we may see some bold government elections uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, we may see more governments following suit in the coming weeks. We may see more societal actions uh, in the coming weeks. We may see some more uh, business entities uh, recorrecting their positions like Google did in its relationship with Huawei. So I'm hopeful. When you are in a, in a traumatic situation, I think all of the weakers are living in trauma right now. When you're in a tragic uh, and traumatic situation, uh, you're vulnerable. Uh, you're vulnerable for criticism, uh, vulnerable for false accusations, vulnerable to false controversies. Uh, it, it, when confronting these kind of things, uh, you need to stay focused because some people with the encouragement of some government entities may be doing just that to distract you, disturb you, and discourage you. And in some instance, discredit you. So with a, a understanding and the mental preparedness uh, in dealing a situation like this, specifically and especially against a government like China, with all the resources, diplomatic influence, economic power, uh, in a position to do anything, to distract you, uh, to discourage you, or even destroy you. The one lesson uh, that uh, resistance movement, I would say in a general term, always found a victim when they were either uh, forced to or unintentionally got into uh, internal disputes, cat fighting, at the encouragement or design of some design of at the uh, des by design or encouragement of an external force, vociferous force. When that happened, if you're not vigilant, 
this is evident in many cases, you know, all the conflicts in the Middle East, uh, the Kurdish situation is one typical one. The Tibetans also have experienced similar thing. Uh, in every resistance movement that you go, uh, you hear a lot of internal catfighting. And one thing that is very common is that they found the victim, found the trap that is created by someone that they have not been able to see. So there are a lot of examples around the world, uh, successful and unsuccessful res uh, resistance movement. There are commonality uh, in both uh, successful ones and unsuccessful ones. And I, I, I've studied, analyzed the unsuccessful ones because of those uh, weaknesses and vulnerability being identified and, and being attacked. And those individuals um, uh, played victim not played victim and fallen victim. I cannot do anything because I have no contact with them. Uh, in the past, I was able to uh, exchange photographs, video chat, and, you know, maintain uh, some connectivity, uh, but it's gone. They've taken, away, taken that away from us. What does that do to you? It's terrible. Just imagine that you cannot even call your father on important days like birthdays. Just imagine that you don't know if your family members or loved ones who brought you to this world are even safe or even breathing, or if they have any needs. Imagine that you were unable to spend holidays with your family members, even by phone, by video chat. I came to a group with the reality that this is this uh, this is what I have to deal with for the time being. So I don't spend too much time worrying about my inability to uh, maintain contact uh, with my uh, parents. Uh, I don't know how the others been uh, doing this, but I have realized that this is something that I have to deal with. So I I don't spend a lot of time worrying or feeling sad. Um, because it's counterproductive. There's nothing positive will come out of it. Um, I have an enormous support in the household that I live with my wife and my son. Having a healthy family environment uh, helps you to build a professional life outside of the house. So uh, I am enormously grateful for the environment that I have with my wife, with my son, and my house. There are several uh, necessary tools to be an effective advocate. One is a knowledge base uh, that should start with their home country or adopted country, understand the political system, uh, make connections uh, with like-minded people. Uh, if it's an organizational setting, sister organizations is, is one way to go. And the second thing is to um, understand uh, the rights of the citizens of your adopted country. Uh, one problem that I identified uh, or have sensed in Uyghur communities around the world is that they are kind of uh, disconnected from their governments. That is understandable because there's no government protection available for uh, individuals or people like the Uyghurs in China. So the government is... Um, oftentimes perceived as a, a tool for oppression. Um, so there's not much hope and faith in the government, but it works differently uh, in the societies that uh, were uh, Uyghurs, particularly in the West, uh, taken up in citizenship or established residence. These governments are for the people. Uh, and if you reach out to your government officials, with the uh, reasonable request, with the, the right approach, um, you'd be surprised how much impact that it will make. And then um, the third advice is that um, the power of media. Instead of making the issue as part of the domestic uh, debate or controversies, try to make the issue as a bipartisan issue or issue for collective support that transcends uh, party politics uh, personal views on certain individuals or the local government. 
so building a consensus uh, is very important uh, in advocacy. And then the fourth, um, if you can establish a good uh, team to work with, um, can be very useful. And finally, uh, if you're having health issues, uh, this is more private issue for each individual. If you're having uh, signs of depression or psychological concerns, um, I would encourage you to see us a therapist. Uh, this would help because it can freely confide with people who has professionally who has professional training uh, and in the situation to give you a necessary advice that would in, enhance that would improve your mental health so those are the things that I would advise uh, to uh, existing activists uh, advocates or aspiring advocates or individuals who wanted to be part of it <music>